Hello and welcome to another episode of Script to Screen. I'm your host, Mark Bauer. This is a talk show where I interview local writers and filmmakers of the Corridor area. Today my guest is Eva Anderson. Eva, hi. Hello, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you for being here. So you're pretty local to, uh, you're from Center Point originally. Mm -hmm. And you went to UNI, UNI for college. Yes, go Panthers, uh -huh. purple and gold, baby. What did you study there? So there, uh, I started off as a music major. I play the saxophone, so, which is why I still partially call myself a sax diva, because diva rhymes with my name, Eva Diva, <laughs> saxophone. Um, <laughs> and I uh, started off majoring in music, and I did that for a few years, and then I switched to communication studies and kept music as a minor. So I play jazz saxophone, I did that in college, as well as, um, do, being part of the communication program with an emphasis on media. Was there a marching band that you were also in, or was it just jazz? Oh, jazz band. Just jazz. I mean, I cheered on the marching band. I think I was the only one who went to the football games with the intention of of cheering really hard for the marching band because that's when most people would get up yeah. and go get their concessions. But I said no. My fellow on the tuba and my friend on the flute, they need a shout out. Yeah. So I would always like run down the aisles and like be like, yeah, <laughs> Meredith, because my friend Meredith was directing the band. <laughs> yeah. That's what my parents do back home. They'll go to the oh. football games for the band. I was in band too. I also played saxophone, so. You know, and I, I always say anybody who plays the saxophone has the cool gene in them. Like there, there is genetic makeup for coolness and it's present in all saxophone players, so congratulations. Well, thank you, yes. and you as well. Thank you. When did you decide to make the change to communications? What kind of sparked that? Well, I love playing the sax, and I, I played it since uh, fifth grade, but I knew starting in kindergarten that it's what I wanted to do, so that was always in my heart. But kind of as I started to get deeper and deeper into my studies in music, I realized I wanted to always be something that's on, on the edge, cutting edge, growing, expanding, getting the massive amount of reach, which is why I wanted to go into communication because that's what it is. It's about reaching a huge, uh, a huge audience and not just patrons of a jazz club, for example. Did you have any prior knowledge of journalism? Were you involved in like the school paper? Did you write at all before then? I did. So I only wrote, I want to say maybe Four times in our uh, the Northern Iowa, and it was called. I covered a fashion show once on campus, and then I had a column called Office Hours, where I would interview local professors about things that they do outside of work. Uh, so, was that typically what your focus was kind of these features of uh, different events and people? Yeah, in as far as the what I my biggest educational tool I feel like in college was partially learning on the side, learning on my own, doing these side projects because I take the skills that I would learn in class and then instead of going out to the bars on Thursday nights, I would be in my dorm room and I'd edit till two in the morning. Um, I'd make YouTube videos. I'd just get obsessed with, you know, creating things and uh, so much so that my junior year of college, I was hired to write and direct the promotional videos for an entire university of 15,000 students and that was something I was very proud of and I made it really fun. I wrote a music video called Love to Be a Panther. Yeah. Um, <laughs> love to be a panther, love to kick it in the dome because we have a unidome, yeah. that's where we play football. Um, they sent me off to college, now I found another home. And so, you know, I had some of my jazz friends record the background music for it. And, and I, I did this whole colorful music video about our university um, f to promote it. And then it played in the admissions office for years. And so uh, students who were younger than I was later, uh, they'd be like, they'd tell my mom, who's a high school teacher, oh, I saw your daughter in the admissions office at UNI dancing, you know, in a cheerleading outfit or whatever. I wore some kind of UNI yeah. skirt <laughs> and shirt and all that. But... So that was really kind of what I did as far as um, tackling these side projects. And then I decided, like, 
I need to get off to one of the coasts. I love it here in Iowa because I love all the people here and I had the best time ever at UNI. Loved all my professors, loved all the students. And, uh, but I had ants in my pants to go to LA or New York. So between my junior and senior year, I had an internship in Los Angeles at Entertainment Tonight. And while I was there, I spent time with Mark Steinis, who was a host at the time, who had also graduated from UNI. And I had great fun, and I learned a lot about the entertainment industry, and I also started taking improv at the Groundlings um, Improv Group, which is where Will Ferrell has studied, mm. as well as, um, lo I mean, lots of other uh, really great people. Almost all of the SNL alum yes. comes from the ground lanes or UCB. Yep, so, yeah. exactly. That and Second City. So I, I did that and then I was like, oh, okay, cool. I want to do this. So I went back for my senior year, squished all of my classes until the, the fall semester so I could graduate or be done with my classes a semester early. So then the last half of my senior year, I went to the other coast. I went to New York City to intern at the Colbert Report. Loved that. Loved New York City more than LA. I said, okay, this is where I'm moving after college. What were some of the things you were doing as an intern at either job? Well, at Entertainment Tonight, I spent time with Mark Sinus. We ha kind of have a, had a special internship because of the relationship that he had with you and I. Mm. So we kind of hung around him the whole time, didn't do a lot of bringing coffee, which was kind of awesome. Um, I was a little bit of a rogue intern there, I have to admit, because I was still wanting to meet stars. I hadn't developed, I hadn't developed professionalism yet in, as far as being in the entertainment industry so much that I still wanted to take pictures with people yeah. and I still wanted to be a star chaser even though I was part of it. So I, it was a big stepping stone for me professionally, but I was, not liked there, I think, in the end. And I learned a lot because yeah. my pants were scared off by the time I went to the Colbert Report. I said, I will not make eye contact with Steven. Okay, I will sometimes, but yeah. I need to be very like show up early, dress yeah. to the nines, bring them their coffee and everything there. So I was very like straight laced at the Colbert Report internship. Uh, but that was a blast. Uh, we had different things we do every day of the week. So Monday I was in scripts. I would go around and uh, deliver all the printed scripts to the script supervisor, the writers, um, the producers. Um, Tuesday I did production. So sometimes they would need us to find things in the tape room. Like they'd be like, okay, we need a clip for this episode. We're going to splice up a bunch of Sean Hannity clips. Can you go and find the October 12th, 2000? eight episode of Sean Hannity or whatever, and so I'd go and pull that out for them. Uh, Wednesdays, I was in props, which was so much fun because I would go all across the city and buy out sections of like Play-Doh at the toy store. One time I had to buy blue smoke uh, at a magic shop and just different things that Steven would need. And then, uh, then my last day, I did four days a week. One of them was in the kitchen. So I was just literally making sure they had enough apples and coffee and cereal. Well, that sounds like a, a varied experience. And in terms of growing up, you know, I think it's easy for anybody in that environment for the first time. I mean, you hadn't even graduated college yet, mm -hmm. and suddenly you're in L.A. You've got all these people you've seen on TV before. I think it's easy to get caught up in that. But... You were able to make that turnaround, yes. uh, which I think is more important than anything. Were there other experiences or things you learned from these internships? At, at Colbert, I learned uh, a lot about just how well informed the writers had to be. And, and I was really just in awe of how they were able to turn things on a daily basis. At SNL, they had a week. Um, I kind of learned about how cutthroat things are at SNL where, you know, a writer could work one whole week on a sketch and have it cut by Saturday night. And then who are they calling on Saturday night to be like, Mom, Dad, you want to watch me tonight? No, they're not even going to be on. So, like, I learned about kind of the heartache and heartbreak of being at some of those high-profile jobs, too. It's not all peaches and cream, you know, which is very good oatmeal flavor. But, like, yeah. it's not always that great. After SNL, did you stay in New York? What was your next move? I stayed in New York for six years after that. 
I continued studying improv and sketch writing and it took stand-up classes and TV writing classes. I did everything. I started auditioning for theater and commercials and um, along the way I did plenty of different things. I probably waitressed at every restaurant and cafe and ping pong bar and lounge you could think of. Yeah. So there was a lot of that as well. I imagine a lot of that also informed some of your improv or sketch writing. You know, you get to see all parts of the city, people from different walks of life. Did that help having all of this craziness going on? It did. It did. I ended up doing a little mini web series called What Eva It Takes, like whatever it takes, yeah. whatever, Eva. And uh, it was about surviving and thriving in New York City and everything from dating to finding an apartment to um, surviving on St. Patrick's Day where it's like the crazy holiday where everybody's vomiting on the ground because yeah. it's so drunken. Um, I would start off by telling a personal story of something that I had experienced and then interview other people on the street about it and that was something that was a lot of fun. I did that through a uh, an online uh, magazine called New York Native. Now you would also, uh, I don't know if you had produced it or attempted to produce the, a certain web series where you were a superhero. Is yes, right? yeah. yes, The Sax Kitten. Okay, that's, an, that's one of my things that I created that never, uh, I never saw into fruition. I feel terrible for wasting so many people's time on it. But I had a black leather jumpsuit that I, that I had somebody sew on a big, uh, gold glittery sequined saxophone and it was about a superhero it was about a, a an aspiring jazz musician who moved from Iowa to New York City yeah. and her mom wanted her to come back to Iowa which my mom always told me to come back to Iowa the whole time and she uh, this girl wasn't really finding her way as a jazz musician. It was hard to make it, but then she runs into the ghost of an old jazz musician who gives her a magic saxophone reed that when she puts it on her saxophone, she uh, blows into it. Uh, she can break up crime. And actually, the superhero endeavor was because um, Stan Lee had sponsored uh, the building of a superhero set at YouTube, I believe. It was some relationship with Stan Lee and uh, you could apply with a pilot or a pitch of a superhero idea, and I got selected as one of the people. So and so then I used the set, and then I never finished editing it, as happens with so many people. So I, I hated myself for it yeah. for a while, and then I got over it, because it happens to a lot of people. About how many people had tried for that uh, specific uh, contest, or do you know how many people you beat out? I'm not for that? sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm really not sure. I know several people did do it because there was a party at YouTube where everybody kind of showed their work, and I didn't. Yeah. But I had fun and I won the costume contest because ain't nobody beating a sax kitten. <laughs> I brought my saxophone. There was music. We were in the YouTube studio and like there was music pumping and drinks and food and the lights were like they had cool lighting and I was playing my saxophone along to the music um, as I often did at weddings and things that I was hired to do. I'd like burst out and play on my sax. Oh, see stuff that you can do in New York. You know, yeah. it's it's. I had so many creative experiences. That sounds pretty impressive that you could just start playing. Like, you just, anything, like jazz? Like. Uh, jazz, pop music is a lot easier to play than jazz, so. Uh, but one of the things that I've always uh, kind of been uh, better at is playing by ear. So I could listen to something and play along with it. I could find the key right away. I can hop right in. Um, and, I mean, not on any hard jazz tune, but certainly on pop music because they tend to go the same three yeah. chords the whole time anyway and tend to sort of be in the same keys. So uh, it was fun and easy and yeah, people would always be very impressed. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, thank you all my jazz professors at UNI because I really owe the credit to them. Eventually through different auditions, not necessarily that one, but just kind of maybe getting tired of that you you eventually I don't know did you go back to school after that yes so okay. um, for years and years I, I finally kept saying well I don't want to eventually get into my 30s and 
still be struggling. I eventually um, did did decide to put in grad school applications, and so I applied to uh, three schools all in New York City, and I got accepted into Columbia Journalism School, and I went, I attended a one-year graduate program specifically concentrating in documentary. And I said to myself, I need to find a job that allows me to be creative, work with lots of people, meet people, and if I can still be on camera, I'll do it because I like presenting on camera. And being a broadcast journalist allowed me to do all of that. Columbia did not have a broadcast journalist uh, concentration. They only had data journalism, investigative, and documentary. So I said, I'll do documentary because I'll get a, it's the only one with um, a camera involved. And if I can get really good behind the camera, um, then I can produce better work in front of it as well. Had you had any experience working in documentary before then? No, not documentary. I had just made lots of YouTube videos, but not ever a documentary. I had made like a seven minute mini doc in undergrad, but this, yeah. So tackling it for the first time in school, what were some things you were learning as you were going? I learned, I learned everything from how to just like the nuts and bolts of operating the camera to long form storytelling to how many interviews I need to have and having like half hour interviews at a time that I have to by hand transcribe and then save that and then do another interview. Like, so we had hours of interviews transcribed and like, oh, when we, uh, so I made a documentary called A Different Script and uh, it was about, um, is about a young man named Christopher Lopes who is an aspiring actor and he happens to have Down syndrome. So I was looking at uh, how people with intellectual disabilities break into the professional um, field of acting and what that is like because something that I had experienced as an actor was um, how hard it was so I thought how hard is it for somebody with a disability. So. Um, I got to know the family and they were amazing and you know but every yeah every step of the way was like complete learning experience. The first day we went up to meet them and we did not film at all. I think the second time we started I'm filming. I'm sorry I don't mean to interrupt. You yeah. had a partner on this project. Yes, yes. We. Um, Francesca Carter, my best girl. She's amazing. She's my work wife. I miss her a lot, and she, she and I worked together completely on everything. It was a complete partnership of uh, writing, directing, editing, and um, producing, uh, all complete shared budgeting, all of that. Uh, we all shared those roles. And so we went up to meet the Lopes family in Connecticut, and we we're uh, potentially interviewing several different families that um, ha that were actors with uh, dis disabilities and we just fell in love with the family and then at, over getting to know them you know we'd obviously put down the camera have a meal with them chat with them and then slowly you know we became friends in terms of actually filming with them obviously you can't go up there every single day mm -hmm. was there a schedule worked out how did they they kind of let you know beforehand, hey, he has an audition coming up? Yeah, it was a lot of give and take. It was like, hey, let us know if he has an audition, or hey, we don't have class on this day, can we just come up and, and film you for a bit? Uh, his sister lived in Philly, and so, and they lived in Connecticut, so we would take, we would uh, take the train to Connecticut, and if his sister was visiting, we'd want to make sure we can get them interacting together. Um, we wanted to get enough interviews with each family member and really make sure we could get uh, even just them having dinner together and what was that like. So we did this whole, we went on this whole trip to Massachusetts to film him speaking about disability and media at uh, a theater festival and that was two days and a hotel worth and everything and we never even used that at all. So I mean there's just like when you're filming something that's long form like that that you don't know what direction it's going to take and what, it's gonna, what you're going to squeeze out at the edit room at the end of the day, you have to kind of just be open to going well this is a time, energy and money and I'm scrapping it 
but ultimately what makes a cut is it has to be what appropriately fits in with the, whole, the story as a whole. What's it like to find a story within a documentary as opposed to writing a script? <laughs> a lot of index cards, yeah. a lot of index cards. Um, we basically, we said, okay, we have a really interesting person. We have a funny person, charming, talented. So we have a great character. We don't have a beginning, middle, and an end. We know that we started filming in February, and we know that we ended filming him in about July, but where does it end? So what we did is we took all of our interviews, we printed all of them out, pages and pages, and we, we highlighted the quotes and the pieces that we thought really resonated and got at the heart of Chris and what it really meant to be an actor with a disability. And we would put them all out and we'd be like, okay, which quotes from our sit down interviews would go well with this? And so we just, we started making like a long caterpillar of note cards and quotes that stretch across the floor of our edit room. and. We're rearranging things and rearranging things so it kind of looked like the Candyland board yeah. where it's a bunch of colorful squares that snake around. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually we came up with something, so. Did that cut down on the amount of time you had to edit, sort through video, or was that, yes. that was still an arduous process? It was an arduous process, but towards the end we skipped, I don't want to say we skipped a little bit of it, but um, we had to be more uh, rapid with our time. As we became more comfortable with our material and the story and kind of what we were starting to form, we didn't have to log every little piece. So this documentary was your thesis uh, and you've since taken it to film festivals. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, I love film festivals. It's so much fun and I've been to them with you, yes. so that makes it extra fun. Um, so, so far we've been to two film festivals, the Cedar Rapids Independent Film Festival mm -hmm. and the Iowa Motion Picture Awards. Yeah. And both of them have been a blast. At, uh, at the Cedar Rapids Film Festival, we won first place for student documentary and we actually also won Audience Choice Award, which was very unexpected. Yeah. And very, I was very honored. It was so special. It was a very special moment. Um, I really wish not only Francesca, but Chris and his family would have been able to be there. But we're planning on taking it to film festivals in Connecticut, New York, um, and uh, my partner Francesca, uh, my film partner Francesca works in London now, and so we are going to take it international. So, Have you reached out to any sort of nonprofit groups that work with people with disabilities to have them watch it or show it? Yeah, yes. I'm planning on working with the ARC of East Central Iowa. I've spoken to them about it uh, on two different occasions now, and it's just a matter of uh, finding the time now and working that into our film festival schedule. And everything is a conversation with Francesca. I want to make sure that she's a part of all of that, even if I'm doing something in Iowa and she's in London that, you know, she knows about what's going on and knows where it's being screened. And so that's all sort of to come in these next few months, I think. But uh, certainly the arc, and then we were accepted into another film festival in Bozeman, Montana. And that is going to be screened um, along with a presentation of a stu uh, men and women from this program for people with disabilities called, I can't remember, I think it's called REACH. And uh, so they'll be sp speaking about what it, what it's like to live and thrive as an adult with a disability. And so the whole nonprofit is going to be coming to that screening. I suppose we should talk about it at some point. You are also a local reporter here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, after finishing school, you decided to move back and got the job at uh, KGAN. Mm -hmm. So you're a morning reporter. Can you talk about what that's generally like on a day-to-day -day basis? Lots of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I wake up, I try to wake up before 2 a.m. So I wake up at around 1.40, maybe press news a couple of times. Yep, into the newsroom at 3.30 a.m. and on air twice an hour from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. and then again at noon. Uh, every day I'm finding a new story. A lot of the times since it is so early, it's who wants to get up with me at 5 a.m. and chat for a few hours. Uh, but I really get to meet so many interesting people 
and uh, become really entrenched in the community in a way that maybe I wasn't before because when I back when I lived in Cedar Rapids I was a teenager I was off going to college but now I get to see so many different things and you know for example this morning I spent so, uh, some time at a festival uh, that I covered and so I'm finding out about different things around the corridor um, that I'm able to not only report on at work but then spend some time in my free time with because I you know have developed a love for it or taken interest in it. I imagine that's probably the most rewarding part is getting to interact with all the people of the community and see these different events. Yes. The most rewarding thing is uh, being able to tell the story of somebody who is so passionate about something and I relate to that passion so hard. Uh, I will say generally some of my favorite people to interview are creatives are people who are done, doing something very creative, um, artists, musicians, painters. I love it. I love it so much. And it takes me back to New York in a way. Um, and so being able to showcase what they do visually and um, you know, story-wise, it's, it's really a gift to be able to do that. So you've completed the documentary What's next for you? Well, keep on journalisting yeah. and TV newsing. And next, I would love to start working on the side on another creative project. And I am trying to decide, is it going to be a vlog? Is it going to take the form of a vlog? Is it going to be something that's uh, uh, kind of like this, maybe a talk show? Or is it something that's going to be a little combination of both, something with a personal stories combined with uh, talking to experts or you know interesting people and maybe some animation. Uh, I always said that my ideal show would be a combination between Ellen and Colbert Report uh, because it, it's because the Colbert Report was very educational and you got your news from it as well as your funnies and then an adult Sesame Street yeah. <laughs> because it's colorful and there's music and there's sketches and there's costumes so I would like that so like Ellen Stephen Colbert adult Sesame Street all wrapped up in a bow that's the Eva show and I would call it evolution evolution are you going to be playing the theme song on, your saxophone? on my saxophone darn right <laughs> I am yes that is that is that is a stipulation Great. Do you have any advice for someone looking to get into documentary, reporting, music, anything that you're interested in? I have the dumbest, most stereotypical Nike slogan a answer, but it's just do it. Don't make excuses. Don't, don't waste your time. Don't, you know, would you really, would you waste somebody else's time? No then don't waste your own time. Don't say you're going to do it and you know, kind of talk about it and just keep on going, you know, no. Don't waste your time. Do it. Get it over with. I mean, it's fun. like, you know, maybe you might have to go through a learning curve at first, but we are blessed today with hashtag blessed. We are blessed today with the huge amount of resources, YouTube tutorials, cheap camera equipment, um, and social media connectivity to highly skilled and talented people who are ready and willing to answer questions, there is almost no way you can make an excuse except for time. That is hard. But if you really want it, as I say, if you want it that badly, you're going to make time for it. Well, great. I want to thank you for being here on the show, Eva. Hope thank you. you. Oh, I had an excellent time. Cheers. Yes. We'd rather be making TV, and you know what? We are at PATV. How about it? <laughs> Thank you for watching this episode of Script to Screen. We'll be seeing you next time.